Hi everyone, I'm Jacob Sills, the co-founder and CEO of Uptrust. Welcome to today's webinar, The Power of Community, the second in a series of talks focused on pragmatic strategies to drive decarceration and increase racial equity in your community. While our first webinar focused on bringing probation back to its rehabilitative roots, a model of reform from the inside out, today we're broadening our lens and speaking with national thought leaders around a variety of strategies some inside and some outside that reframe the status quo and question some widely held beliefs around power and accountability. At Uptrust, we build software to help people navigate and successfully exit the criminal justice system. Today, you're gonna to hear about amazing people with amazing strategies that have led to decades of jail and prison nights avoided, whose strategies can all be deployed in your backyards. And to guide us on that journey, is Director of Public Defender Partnerships, Sean Riley. Sean? Thanks, Jacob. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, The Power of Community, hosted by Uptrust. We are really excited to have over 140 people joining us today from all over the country. My name is Sean Riley. I'm the Director of Public Defender Partnerships here at Uptrust. And before joining Uptrust, I was a public defender for 12 years at the Bronx Defenders, eight of which I was the Deputy Director focused on the development of holistic defense. Holistic defense is a method of representation focused on uh, bringing community engagement into the public defender practice. I left public defender work about a year and a half ago to become director of public defender partnerships. And the webinar today won't be about Uptrust or our products. However, please feel free to visit our website or shoot me a note afterwards if you're interested in learning more about us. We are a technology company focused on promoting criminal justice reform and continuing uh, education through candid conversations about ways to improve the system. Our format today is going to be very casual and hopefully interactive with all of you. We have a couple of questions for our panelists, and then we'll jump into Q&A for the remaining minutes. Please submit questions to the Q&A feature at the bottom menu bar. I would now like to give our speakers a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. Raj, would you mind kicking us off? Sure. Hi, everybody. It's great to join you all in this important conversation. My name is Raj Jaidev. I'm the coordinator of a community organization here in San Jose, California called Silicon Valley Debug. And we created an organizing model for families and communities to impact the outcome of cases in the court system that we call participatory defense. And it's an organizing model in which families whose loved ones are facing criminal charges could essentially be an extension of the defense team to impact the outcome of the case and then collectively transform the landscape of power in the court system. We've been doing it here in San Jose for uh, about 15 years and, and then we started sharing the model and the approach with other community organizations across the country about eight years ago. We now have a national participatory defense network in over 30 cities of community organizations partnering with public defenders offices to free people and end incarceration in the respective cities and counties. Thanks, Raj. Sarah? Hi, my name is Sarah Moore. I'm a, the co-founder of a grassroots group of uh, folks in Northwest Arkansas called Arkansas Justice Reform Coalition. And uh, uh, my background actually was in uh, the corporate world, actually was in um, uh, national cells and left that behind about nine years ago after being in that world for over 10 years um, and uh, uh, have been doing this work the last couple of years. So I'm just a, um, by happenstance, ended up um, in this arena and actually um, have found my passion and uh, the work I think I'll be doing the rest of my life. Thank you, Sarah. Clinton? Greetings. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today in this conversation. I'm Clinton Lacey. I'm the director of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services in Washington, D.C., which is D.C.'s uh, youth justice uh, system or agency. Um, prior to that, I was deputy commissioner of probation in New York City um, for four years. Um, prior to that, I was with the W. Hayward Burns Institute in Oakland, where we work nationally on racial and ethnic and gender disparities in the justice system. Um, I would just add that before that, I worked for several years with youth at Rikers Island. All of those experiences that I mentioned really, I think, come together in, in, in several ways. But one important way, I think, is in um, advancing 
opportunities um, from a position where I am now inside of the system to, uh, to advance community engagement, community capacity building, and really a process of reimagining uh, the justice system as we know it and how it impacts those communities, most particularly in the form of a, one of our, I guess, flagship initiatives is the Credible Messenger Initiative, which I'm excited to talk about as the conversation unfolds today. Thank you. Thank you, Clinton. Wes? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, great to be here. Um, Wesley Keynes, I am the Chief of Staff of the aforementioned Bronx Defenders, where Sean once did his work. Um, I, I used to introduce myself by saying I'm an impacted person, but I've stopped doing that. And the reason I've stopped doing that is because we're all impacted. Like our criminal legal system impacts and touches all of us, whether we can see that or not. Hopefully after this call, you will be able to see how you were personally impacted and how you can get involved in that. Um, so my work at the Bronx Defenders is what you would imagine a typical chief of staff job to be cutting across the entire organization. But the other part of my job, which is not typically seen as a chief of staff role is I direct our systemic reform work, which means that it is the work that deals most directly with us looking to transform our criminal legal system. That is our policy infrastructure. It is our community organizing where we build community power. It is our strategic communications department, which seeks to rewrite narrative that for far too long has really dehumanized and removed agency from community members. And it is our impact litigation practice, which frankly, sometimes you have to sue our government to get them to do the right thing. Um, so though, hopefully this conversation will have you walking away, really rethinking about some of the roles that we have allowed our government to take on in our society and how that impacts certain people, mostly black and brown and poor people. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all our panelists for, for joining us today in this discussion. So our theme today is community involvement. Going through the justice system is an incredibly isolating experience. Men and women are purposefully separated from their communities as a form of punishment and made to navigate a scary, opaque, complex system by themselves. Involving the community has shed light on some of those systems. It has given individuals the confidence that, they are, that there are people fighting for them and that they are not alone. Over the past couple of decades, there's been a noticeable change. Communities all over the country have uh, built innovative models of support to help those charged with crimes at each stage of the process. Today, we'll be focusing on community interventions having a significant impact on individuals navigating pretrial, probation, and parole. One thing to keep in mind, while some of these programs we discussed today are pretty complex, even the most basic intervention involving the community is incredibly powerful. Too often, community intervention is thought of as unattainable, except in the most resource-rich areas. That does not need to be the case. Today, we'll be focusing on practical steps for implementing these types of interventions, regardless of the size or budget of your department. So without further ado, let's jump into the discussion with our incredible panelists. Sarah, I'd like to start with you. You represent a group that was born in the community, focused on making a systemic change. Can you walk us through how that started? Well, I alluded to it in the intro about this was very just um, happenstance. It was very organic um, and, and, and one thread has kind of led to the other, but I think it's it's a lot of times these movements happen and, and organizing occurs around the straw that breaks the camel's back. So um, for me, I had been working with individuals in our community for the, and, and people in my family close to me for the last 15 to 20 years, struggling with addiction and mental illness. And oftentimes um, those folks entangle with the justice system, you know, and there's a, I was brought up um, and many people in our communities are brought up with the, um, uh, especially people that are that look very much like me and have my privilege that you can just you know avoid these areas but um much like wesley spoke about i mean there's a war on the poor on black and brown skinned individuals and in particular those that are really struggling with addiction and mental illness and so i showed up to a quorum court meeting because i waited over a year um, past the deadline for a resource in our community to open up that would 
divert individuals from jail and ha actually get them mental health help. And I was just done and fed up. And uh, that's where I went to, to voice my concerns. My sheriff uh, showed up with um, no sophisticated information, um, no assessment of need, and wanted to double um, the size of our current jail, which actually um, we over incarcerate in the state of Arkansas um, across the nation. Um, we're like the number four incarcerator in the country. Um, our county um, over indexes as well as we stay, we stand today, and he wanted to double those beds um, and spend $38 million of taxpayer dollars. Um, and so I just thought that just seemed very illogical. And so uh, there was another community member um, who, who was there too for another reason. Um, we both spoke up and started doing work over um, a couple of month period and we just gained momentum, um, just stepping up and, and, and being brave, I guess, and, and having that first time that, that to speak and interrupt the system was so important because what we heard later from Justice of the Peace within the Quorum Court, usually they could take a bowling ball and they could just send it down the aisle of the Quorum Courtroom and they'd never hit anybody. Um, so we started to have folk, folks showing up in these spaces. And so, um, I mean, that's how we just, um, again, I say just organically, we, we started just to, to spread energy within our community as we um, continue to just have conversations between elected officials, um, concerned uh, community members, uh, you know, attorneys, people within the system would reach out to us and want to share information. And so ultimately, um, our organization was able to defeat that expansion. Um, we've gone on to um, advocate for an ombudsman within our facility to get more people out of jail. We brought the Bell Project into town um, to get folks that are too poor to pay out of the jail. Um, we were able to get a criminal justice assessment of the entire system. Uh, we've gotten a criminal justice coordinating committee in place. We're working on putting in uh, pretrial services, reentry, um, and, and nonprofits within uh, our community, getting them to step up and we're not, we're, we're in Arkansas, we understand. Um, we make the top of lists that aren't the list you wanna be on. I mean, we're tops in teen pregnancy, um, obesity, um, the opiate epidemic is raging here. Um, we aren't as um, developed and sophisticated a network of um, organizations or resources as some of these other areas of the country that other speakers are at. Um, but we, we have the enthusiasm, I think, and momentum in our state right now. Um, this is not a partisan issue. It's definitely, it's bipartisan. Um, it's a human, it's a human situation. And there's also fiscal responsibility. So there's, there's, there's lots of folks, um, kind of like Wesley alluded to, we're all touched by it. Even if you think you're not, um, you are. Um, there, there are ripples within our community that this impacts at all levels. So, um, so that, that's, that's, I guess, uh, kind of how we got into it and, and the evolution that's happened with, uh, with our coalition. Thanks, Sarah. Wesley, you're also working on systemic change, but from a different angle. Can you talk about the importance of community engagement as you work to change the system from the inside? Sure. So it, it would be very difficult and, and frankly condescending for the Bronx Defenders of Public Defender Organization to embark on policy reform initiatives without engagement with not only our clients, but also the community which we serve. Um, we feel that that's like the foundation of what gives us our mandate is to make sure that we are engaged in the community and that we are leveraging the community's voice in, in, in any advocacy work that we do, any policy reform work that we do. Um, that comes with some challenges. It comes with some responsibility. It requires, first of all, a, a historical analysis of what it is that targeted communities have endured by systematic racism, structural inequality, and quite intentional generational actions against those communities without coming to the work with that understanding in mind and without having that as a framework for engaging with communities sometimes you can walk away thinking that you know the answers to make people's lives better better perhaps than they do and and that could never be the case um so i think that any 
any actors who are seeking to transform the system on, on behalf of a community, whether they are a part of that community or not, it's incumbent upon them to engage the community in dialogue and, and really help that community to leverage its voice so that they have an equitable stake in, first of all, the ideas that are put forth about what has happened in the community, what is happening in the community, and the solutions that are contributed to address those issues. Thank you. <laughs> Raj, you also work with public defenders, um, ensuring that the voice of the community is heard. Can you talk about the challenges of bringing the community into the courtroom? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, part of the challenge is because of the designs of the systems, which, you know, Sean, as you described earlier, was set up particularly to create uh, an atmosphere of isolation and to insulate the court apparatus from community pressure. Uh, I think it was designed in that way to allow the facilitation of the systemic oppression that, that uh, Wesley was, was talking about. Um, and so what that means is for when a community wants to engage in, in challenging incarceration, they're not sure necessarily how they actually get a toehold to make proximate change. Proximate change meaning, is my neighbor home or are they locked in a cage? Or is my cousin going to jail or staying free? Um, and so really the, the way we've tried to do that is to essentially penetrate that court system through an ethos of community organizing. And what that means is being to build with the legal advocates that are sitting next to our loved ones in court, which are namely public defenders. And, you know, Sarah mentioned something earlier around the presence of court. And I got to say that, you know, there's a public defender here in Santa Clara, Avi Singh, who said one time after we were sitting with uh, his client's mother, um, uh, who was in a trial for someone that, a black man that was shot by a sheriff, and then was um, facing the indignity of a criminal charge just because he survived the shooting. And I remember walking out of court and thinking like, how is this even possible that um, he would have to face potentially 15 years just because he survived a police abuse case? And Avi turned to us and he said, these injustices happen every day in empty courtrooms. And so for us as, as community, you know, we're not trying to become pseudo lawyers. We're not trying to become pseudo investigators. We're trying to speak from the power and authority intelligence of community. And so that was a call to action that for us to have tangible proximate impact, we needed to be in the courts. We need to be working with public defenders so that there is a, a, a full legal defense team, because the other people we found out, we didn't know this till later, who felt isolated were public defenders, who felt that they're fighting this battle of attrition that was sort of set up for them to lose. And, and certainly the numbers bear that out. The plea rates, the you know over 2 million people incarcerated is indicative of a system that's doing exactly what it was designed to do. So what do you do to, to interrupt that machinery? You allow community organizing to disrupt that, to deconstruct that system and to occupy it with a whole new framework and, and presence. And so that's what participatory defense is, is taking that intuition of community saying, I wanna engage, I'm not sure how, but if we just lean on the same basic science of community organizing, of collectivizing a problem, rather than being isolated. So it's not just one family dealing with incarceration, it's a united front that's connected with a public defender. We can mount an adequate defense. We can let judges and prosecutors know that the person standing before them has support and has a community that's invested in their well-being. And we could transform not just the outcome of these cases, but the entire way that the court deals with the community in general. Thanks, Raj. Clinton, like participatory defense, credible messenger programs focus on helping individuals navigate the system, this time on the probation and parole side. How do credible messenger programs work and why have they been so impactful? Well, thank you for that. And I think the um, the question and my response really sort of echoes or piggybacks on the previous comments um, in a number of ways. I would first say that with regard to credible messenger work, that it uh, really rests on um, historical, you know, principles and uh, activities by quote unquote impacted people um, taking, uh, fighting for and taking leadership, or at least attempting to do leadership of these issues and movements to make change, to imagine uh, new systems, and then to do the work to bring that into being. 
So obviously it's a long legacy of struggle. Um, and I think of Credible Messenger in that way. So in that sense, it's not a new thing, but um, we, we did, and there have for generations been people um, impacting who have shared life experiences, who've been marginalized, who've been impacted by the justice system, who have uh, given their time and their lives to serving and working with people, with families and communities while also struggling to transform systems. Uh, when we had an opportunity, it was an interesting opportunity at New York City probation with regards to, to these large amount of funding, um, we implemented a program called Arches Transformative Mentoring, which was really the first um, credible messenger initiative that was formally a part of or in partnership with a justice agency. So at probation, with the funding we got, we funded 20 organizations in the city and worked very hard in New York City and worked very hard to reach the grassroots and were, were somewhat successful with that, not totally, um, grassroots organizations who were essentially doing the work and were themselves or in relationship with what we now call credible messengers on the ground. And so we were able to formalize and what I think is really critical here as a system, we invested in community, invested in credible messengers to do that work and that work really uh, was defined by serving as transformative mentors, life coaches, uh, big brothers and sisters in a very intensive way that was um, supporting and surrounding, uh, in this case, 16 to 24 year olds on probation um, and working with them to um, answer key questions that we all ask and wanna answer. Who am I? How did I get here? What have been the factors and the drivers that have led me to the justice system. Um, what are the factors that are impacting my community? What role can I play in guiding my own life and also in impacting the community? And how can that itself also help to impact the justice system? So the Credible Messengers had a tremendous uh, impact on the young people through running groups in the community, through being available 24 hours to do crisis intervention, uh, uh, long narratives of, 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 of harmful and, and, and tragic situations that were avoided from homicides to suicides and other things such as that, but then also very proactively intervened and engaged with young people to uh, advance themselves with regards to education and employment and housing and their overall sense of themselves in the community. Ultimately, the Urban Institute did a study that showed a 59% reduction in recidivism as one major measure, but of course there were other measures. Credible Messenger then showed itself with the right investment that it could have a major impact. When I came to DC and we implemented it, we expanded Credible Messenger to be more than what some have reduced it to as a successful, but as a program. And what we've been trying to develop and demonstrate that Credible Messenger is more than a program, although it can be a very successful programmatic uh, method or approach, but it's, it's, it's larger than that. It's a community movement that really is about equipping, in, investing in our leaders in the community. And so we expanded to uh, engage Credible Messengers with families. So in DC, young people who are in our system, their families have their own credible messenger support system that's built into it. Um, and then, and so we see sort of three tiers of credible messenger impact. Certainly uh, clear, um, measurable impact on, on, on young people and, and their families, you know, in, in some of the ways that we would try to measure outcomes, you know, educationally, employment, um, housing, uh, a sense of belonging, um, uh, addressing issues of trauma and all of those things, which is major, but it's also had um, an impact on the credible messengers themselves, right? It's building space out for our brothers and sisters who have been marginalized often through the justice system, but in other ways that there is a, that we create a space because there's such a need for them to be connected and in fact be leaders in this work. But I think there's a third tier of impact that often gets lost and that perhaps is most provocative for systems. And that is that credible messengers are also part of the reimagination of what justice is and how it's operated. Um, that young people and families can be more effectively 
served and supported in their own communities um, with their own community members than by systems themselves. And so I think Credible Messenger's impact, among other things, has also shown that um, our notion of what justice systems are and, 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 and can be, can be radically reimagined. And that our greater value as justice systems are not to continue to be the source and the place of so-called rehabilitation or what have you, but the investors in a community capacity to really own much of that work. And that's where uh, we continue to go. It's grown into a national movement. Several jurisdictions around the country, several cities and communities are who were doing the work are now formalizing that, getting more resources. And fortunately, slowly justice systems, not, it's not fortunate that it's slow, but fortunate that justice systems are beginning to recognize this and leaders uh, with the will um, um, are, 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 and the understanding are beginning to invest in this work, uh, which really represents for me a sort of re distribution, not just the funding to support Credible Messenger, but a, uh, the beginning of what hopefully can be a redistribution of power and position to do what the true work of justice should be. Thank you, Clinton. The four of you represent success stories as far as community engagement and community involvement goes. Reflecting on your experiences, what do you think the greatest barriers are to successful community involvement? And I'll open this up to any of our panelists. I think if I may, oh, oh please, Sarah, you want to go? Oh, no, no, go ahead, Clinton. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, thank you. I, I was just gonna say, you know, thinking about barriers is the um, couple of major things. The, the very thing that I'm, that I believe Credible Messenger and other community capacity efforts can are seeking to do is to address the, the entrenched power, right, that resides inside of systems, justice systems in this context, but others as well, that really needs to be unleashed and redirected to community um, and partners, organizations, and others who are in many ways, as is being demonstrated, uh, better equipped and positioned um, in a number of ways to, to do the sustainable work of, of community engagement and empowerment. And so that power is so entrenched and systems are so uh, sort of, I, I, I always say self-serving, um, sort of even those that are kinder and gentler and smarter and doing better work and using evidence-based practices, those are really good things. They're important things because they, uh, they're doing less harm than historically they have perhaps, some systems are, but yet it's still not uh, focused on, or it still isn't a process that um, uh, engages community. And not just as recipients of better services, right? But engage community as um, voices at, at the table, as drivers, as, um, as contributors, as those who help shape and actually lead the shaping and the definition of, of how justice operates. And I think that that is so entrenched, even among the, 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 the sort of nicer or even more progressive leaders. And so I think the next frontier for the work is to continue to push through and really change the, the sort of the paradigm of how we, how we view uh, institutions of justice. Um, and then of course, on the other side of that is community trauma and hopelessness that is bred through this cycle and so we have work to do, I think, in the community to, 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 to address that, of course, to, because it's gonna be through the demand and participation of community that, that, that this shifts. And so I think that's a, that's a huge barrier, but I think it's one that we continue to, 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 to address. Thank you. Sarah, did you wanna? Well, I'll just add on to, to what Clinton stated, because um, I have very similar you know, feelings around it. What we've observed um, in the things in Arkansas um, has a lot to do with, with access. I think access and, and intimidation of systems. I mean, systems are set up in a way to be oppressive. And so one of the, the things that our coalition's efforts are around are 
um, gaining access to impacted individuals to have a seat at the table. So where I am not intimidated to walk into a space because I've that's, that's how I've been um, brought up. That's how I've been um, engaging in my business background. So it doesn't intimidate me to come into a room where no one else looks like me or they have differing opinions or viewpoints or maybe where it's hostile for me even to get through the door, going through security. And, and so I think being able to show people that they can show up in these public spaces and own them and give them power um, that these are, are their places. I've had people come into the courts and not think that they can sit in the front row of the courts. And I say, no, this front row is yours. You are a taxpayer. You are, this is yours. You own this. You be here. You put your eyeballs uh, on these players because they need to feel this pressure. Um, and the other thing too, that Clinton kind of touched on that I'll really reiterate, um, that's been very eye-opening in just the last several weeks that I'm really pondering and how do we overcome it is, so many of our communities have been undergoing trauma for so long and they're tired. I mean, they're crushingly tired. 2020 has done a number on our communities and we're asking for them to do a lot of emotional unpacking. Additionally, folks are just trying to feed their families. They're just trying to keep their health together. And so how, how do I uh, open up space for them where they can still pay their bills and take care of their children and feed their children but, but come to that meeting and have a seat at the table. Um, that's the, a more complex issue of, you know, we've been set up in such an oppressive system that when you're constantly in crisis mode um, and surviving, then as much as you wanna participate and you've got people urging you to do so, you can't participate. And so there's an additional barrier just because, you know, you need a roof over your head and, um, you know, how, how do we, you know, we talked a lot about, or we talk a lot across the nation about reparations and, and, and trying to get equitable wealth out there. Is there a way potentially to, um, to give some kind of monetary gain to these individuals when they do participate? I mean, that's something that I really wrestle with because if you're having to, uh, decide whether or not going to this meeting where you want to fight for this fair and equitable housing say that really impacts your community but you have shift work and you're gonna you're gonna lose an entire shift's worth of pay to go to that meeting that's a hard that's a hard thing to navigate but that voice is so important because that's the voice that's living on the edge in the bubble and we need to be hearing it and needs to be front and center so um i feel like that for us and our community that's something that we're really grappling with of, of how how to keep uh, those individuals whole and get them a seat at the table. Yeah, I, I, I would like to really echo um, both Sarah and Clinton's um, speaking to the trauma of community and community having the space with which to unpack that trauma in a safe and healthy way before coming to the table part of what the system, the system that just grabs, holds, and acquires more power, part of what it does is that it really solicits, solicits the feedback of community members who reaffirms its power, right? And these community members who they solicit this feedback from oftentimes lack imagination or a nuanced understanding of how it is historic generational trauma has played out in people's psyche. So if you ask someone, are you safe? And they say, no, I'm not safe. What can we do to make you safe? Oftentimes you will find some community members say more police and then the next day, it's the same community members who are protesting too much police because of how police engages the community. So it's like we're asking the police to engage in people's lives in certain ways, which they're more than happy to do. And, and, and then when they create or continue to harm that our government systems have really unleashed on people of color, then the pushback is, we want to have a nicer, gentler way to have the police oppress us. We want them not to call us the N-word as they oppress us. That is not transformational. That is not reform. Reform is seeding the space in community and acknowledging that we have historically harmed certain communities and it was intentional. 
that the justice system is not doing some aberrant thing. It's doing the thing that it was designed to do, control black and brown bodies and to make sure poor people don't rise up and say, where is our stuff, right? So I live and work in the Bronx, New York. And Sari, you mentioned that in Arkansas, you make the list of a lot, you, you're at the top of a lot of lists you don't want to be on. Well, New York City is arguably the wealthiest city in this country. In the Bronx, we have the poorest congressional district in the country. Not Arkansas, not Mississippi, this north-south divide that we tend to ascribe certain you know, uh, uh, um, descriptions to doesn't really play out when you like drill down and get away from the stereotypes. The fact is, is that we have set up a system of how we have ordered our society, which makes it almost impossible for black, brown and poor people to thrive and to really overcome a lot of the systemic things that have been put in their way. And but before we can ask damage folks and folks who have an innate understanding that they are harmed, before we could ask them to come to the table and contribute more to their harm, we need to at least allow for them to heal and then be an equitable partner in identifying the things that can help them to thrive. And, and that's going to require government getting out of the way and stop incentivizing private actors to further exploit these communities because the government sets the stage, private actors build on that, and then generations are trapped in this cycle. And then we blame them. We blame poor people for being poor, right? We blame people who are in survival mode, trying to feed their families and, and pay rent. We blame them because of their, the conditions that we have put in front of them, and they have very few options. So, you know, I, I think this notion of trauma is, is one that we, we really need to have a reckoning with nationally if we really want to engage communities in a way that, that we value their voice. Sean, right. if I, if I could add just real quick, because I, sure. I think everyone covered it uh, beautifully, um, it is uh, to Wesley's point, I, the challenge I don't think is on the community side. This, the, the challenge is on the system side. Community knows what it can do, uh, what is inherent and intuitive to, to our ability to take care of one another. The issue is uh, the fact that the system doesn't see ground as it should if justice really was the aspiration. And to, to put it in, in more kind of like uh, current context, like right now we have people dying uh, of a pandemic in congregated settings in jails and prisons that are designed to create outbreaks. And the system took, released some people that it felt it was sort of uh, medically mandated to do. But outside of that small percentage in jails across the country, we are letting people die in cages. Um, that is what the system is doing. Meanwhile, there's a robust community that's anxious to pr provide, to support, to do whatever they can to look out for the well being of their loved ones. And they're completely kept out of the discussion and not even. Uh, an option on the menu for judges when they talk about releases. So part of it is really being able to challenge that entrenched system that, that Clinton talked about and the culture of the courts, the culture of the system to never acknowledge the power and capacity of community to be solution spaces rather than just sort of the, on the receiving end of, of their mechanical decisions. Uh, what I'll say, for example, is you put it in the context of a pretrial justice. Right now there's a, a, a a discussion happening all across the country around ending money bail because all the reasons that we know and um, should have been obvious for, for generations, right? But what's, what's the space and what's the discussion that's occupying in this replacement? And that's a question of detention and system supervision. And, there, the, and the conversation operates within that bandwidth, uh, that dichotomy of, well, we either keep them in jail for not using money bail or we, we let them out, but they're still gonna be under the control of the system in another way with an ankle monitor, home detention. Meanwhile, community is saying, well, look, there's a third lane altogether. It doesn't need to be this dichotomy of detention or system supervision. Just let, our, our, let us have our people so that we could do what we know how to do. And that means families taking care of their loved ones, communities taking care of their loved ones, 
Uh, and we know for sure that the numbers that we would produce when people were turning to court and having successful pretrial adjudication would be better than the systems. Um, but is that, is that judges, is that prosecutors, is that, is that probation departments haven't seen community as a viable partner, if not the leader of what justice should look like? And so in Santa Clara County, we've essentially just tried to um, penetrate that system and, and create a new opportunity. And so what we do at, at felony arraignments um, every day before you know, we got shut out from the courts because of COVID is we'd have community organizers at felony arraignments talking to families that are there for their loved ones. And the public defenders that are opening those arraignments will say, if you're here for a loved one that's held pre-trial, turn to the debug folks in the back. They have a form that they're gonna work out with you and it's gonna talk about why the tension is problematic, not just for them, but for their families. It's gonna say what role that family or community could, could play to help someone get back to court or remind them of court. Um, and all of a sudden, we're taking away all the excuses the system has to keep someone detained. Because the judge can no longer start from that assumption that if they're released, they're untethered and alone in the world, and then more, more at risk of not showing up at court. Because that is a total myth. People are part of larger communities, and these are communities that want to serve. And so what we've seen just in one courtroom is by repositioning that narrative of not an individual, but as really just an aspect of a larger community that's invested in the well-being, we could get courts to start releasing people to the community rather than ankle monitors, rather than preventive detention. Um, but all to say, I think that work is really challenging all this and all these initial assumptions, which leaves community off the table altogether. And so we have to force our, our ways in if we're going to change the conversation. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, you know, the, this is a tough fight. It's a, it's a tough fight to fight and change is very slow when it comes to the criminal justice system. And the communities that we are talking about are the ones most often marginalized uh, by the criminal justice system. So how do you keep communities involved and engaged in this process? I think you have to be really um, intentional um, about community engagement, right? It's, it, it, it's, it's easy to say, and so often, unfortunately, um, we see a lot of you know, what could be called token engagement, right? Um, going through certain motions, um, providing a certain amount of space for community, you know, gathering and participation, but um, not enough true power share, right? Not enough true um, space, creation and sharing of space and resources to facilitate real participation in the process. So here's a concrete example of what I'm talking about. You know, in New York with Credible Messenger, again, it was a very successful program. Young people were referred to the Credible Messengers. They did group, they did individual work. They were available around the clock with amazing results um, in terms of relationships built, in terms of recidivism avoided, in terms of a number of things. In DC though, as we had an opportunity to expand to engage family, but not again, not just as service recipients, but to create space. So what we did is um, we moved, in New York, probation began to change. Its culture began to shift a bit because of this, this relationship organically. In DC, we decided we were gonna take that head on. And we literally and figuratively moved the credible messengers into our agency. And so now, the case managers who are responsible for young people's, um, the, 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 their case management and the, even supervision of them in the community like a probation officer would do. Um, credible messengers are at the table with the young people developing those plans. At the table, looking at our programming, looking at our policies, not just looking at them, but impacting them, influencing them, designing them and shaping them. And, I speak of credible messengers as representatives of, of, of a larger community, but we also do robust um, family engagement. And it's really about putting resources, creating space and making that a priority of your work, right? So, uh, and, and, and actually acting on the voice that you're hearing, acting on the participation, allowing uh, people to to engage in this process in such a way, and I, I hesitated because I said allowing, 
the power is in our hands. The power is in the government, right? So how do we begin to share that? How do we begin to dismantle this paradigm to where the power is shifted to, to its rightful place? And I think that generates participation is what the point to the question. How do we get folks involved? And I think Wesley was absolutely right with regards and others who were talking about the trauma, the pain, the healing that's needed, and how often community engagement becomes not just tokenism, but it becomes exploitive of the, of the community um, in the name of engagement. Um, and so there must be a real investment in that healing process. But it's um, it, and, 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 and an investment in the development, the support, and the healing of our credible messengers and our other community leaders. And so by really uh, investing in that process, I think you get more involvement and more trust and more belief that there is a legitimate process here, right, of community empowerment, as opposed to just the rhetoric around that. Um, and now this is not, I don't want to romanticize it. I mean, this has been, this has been a, a, a huge challenge to integrate credible messengers and other non-traditional leaders into a justice agency with authority and voice and presence. But it's the work that has to be done. And I can tell you that it has, in a major way, transformed the culture of our agency. And we're not nearly done or where we need to be, right? But we have certainly shown what it takes. Um, and I think that through that, then the community starts to really feel and know that they are part of this process. I would, last thing I would just say is, I think um, we're at the point where should someone try to, let's say, um, go in another direction or, you know, uh, dismantle this community engagement approach that we're involved in, the community, um, which is a huge word, but there would be major pushback, major outcry, major, you know, mobilization around that. And I think that we need to be able to increase the, the that level of ownership and that level of uh, participation. Any brief follow up to Clayton's remarks? I mean, I, I'll just say real quick, I, I don't think there's gonna be any shortage of community want to get involved to fight for the freedom of the people. Um, that 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 isn't something that we, we need to sort of like create some sort of mechanism uh, to, for because that, that is always there. All there really needed to be was a sense of urgency that there was a capacity to have impact. And, and what I'll say is during this, this COVID period, it's been really interesting to see because you know, what we do in participatory fences, families and people facing charges meet weekly and they support each other on how they could uh, reduce the charge or, or get the case dismissed or reduce the sentencing. And when everything became shelter in place and everything was on Zoom, I didn't know if there'd still be a desire to continue these meetings or even start them in new places. But we saw the intensity increase dramatically. And it didn't occur to me that it was because people can't do jail visits to see their loved ones. And they can't even go to court to know what's going on. And if the court was a mystery box before, it's, a, it's, it's exponentially even more mysterious during COVID because you can't go there. You don't know what's going on. You know what they're talking about. The only thing you know is the person you care about is trapped in, in a cage um, where they, they know they're not getting medical treatment and where they're at extreme risk of getting infected with COVID. And so we've seen actually an increase of those meetings. We had to double the size of the meetings here in San Jose. We've had eight new cities go through trainings and participatory defense. So the desire isn't really there. Uh, I mean, is, I'm sorry, isn't need to be questioned, is a question of just getting access uh, in order to have impact. And I think the best thing sort of system players could do is in a lot of ways, just get out of the way um, and, and let community do what it inherently knows how it can do. Thank you. So just briefly before we turn to some of the questions and answers, uh, questions from the audience, if each of you could just briefly talk about uh, you know, what your vision is for how community involvement can transform the justice system. I know that's a big question, but if you could just, uh, you know, give a couple minutes on what you see as the ideal of community involvement in the criminal justice reform movement. Well, I'll jump in. Um, I think Raj keeps um, speaking to fundamental um, ability and readiness um, on the part of community leaders. And community is like a big word, you know, we can unpack that. It's vast, it's, it's, it's um, 
um, not monolithic, but yet when we talk about the most impacted communities who have so for so long been defined as not just the place and the people um, who uh, and the source of pathology, right? Um, um, but rarely has it been communities most impacted been seen as the place and the source of answers and solutions, right? And I think that all of us are talking about flipping that on its head and saying that it's just within the most impacted communities that we have, um, despite the, the trauma and all of the healing that does, of course, need to continue to take place, even in light of that, there is great leadership and ability and readiness. And so this notion of government getting out of the way I think um, speaks to a, 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 a really intentional process of, of, of sharing resources, of redefining the role of systems, again, not as the place and the people who do the work, um, but the place and the, and the people who can facilitate a process of investment and support. And so, you know, it's interesting, the last thing I would say about this is that, you know, some, uh, I guess uh, poli some, some political thought uh, on the right wing talks about small government all the time, right? And get government out, off our backs, right? <laughs> and we know what, a, a lot often what that's about. But it's interesting, that's never applied to the justice system, right? And I think we should apply that to justice, right? And break down this massive apparatus and the billions of dollars that are associated with it and utilize what's valuable there that can be translated into support and investment into community. Um, and so that as has been said throughout the day, we allow people to do the work that we are showing that they can do. Thank you. I would like to also expand the notion of our criminal legal system. That system is more than courts that put people in cages. It's also the courts that separate families, that take black and brown children from families and put them into group homes or foster care and then provide the resources to those alternate systems after children have been separated from families that they would not have provided and do not provide to family members. So that you find that the same behaviors that poor black and brown women are dealing with when their children are taken away like people with means can pay, right? Like we're in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, there are folks who have, you know, internet, there are folks who, you know, can afford to work from home because their jobs allow for that. But a lot of black and brown poor people have to still go out, put themselves and their family at health risk, right? Have to decide on whether or not a 13 year old could watch over a seven year old and make sure that they show up on a Zoom classroom. And if they can't, then the school system is asking the police to do wellness checks. It, it, it's it's like those systems also oppress, those systems also have a very similar impact to the legal system where we take people and put them in cages. Um, and, and, and I think that when, we, when we're looking at this system, we need to expand the notion of all of those ways, as Clinton has said, in which big government intersects people's lives and it does it in a, in a non-equitable way when it comes to black and brown people. It, it's more punitive when it does that. It's more thoughtful when it happens in white and privileged communities around how it can create space for families to thrive. That same grace is not allowed for black and brown and poor people. There's a lot of judgment that's that's packed into their engagement with certain communities. And I, and I, and I think that, you know, to Roger's point, there is not a, um, a deficit of community members who are ready, willing, and able to step up but we need to shift resources. We have seen our criminal legal infrastructure grow over the past generation to an, an enormous measure, right? In New York, NYPD's budget is over 10 billion. I, I said billion, <laughs> right? Think about that. Like it's a municipal police department with a budget that's larger than some countries. Yep. That has to come from somewhere. 
So it comes from schools, it comes from libraries, it comes from community resources. Like these are the conversations that have to happen because it resources must be shifted and it shouldn't be shifted in a hierarchical sense. It shouldn't be someone sitting within those punitive systems and saying, we will allow for you to have X percentage to do this specific thing with. It should be that community members identifies what resources they need and the government provides the resources that the community requests, period. Raj, Sarah, did you want to add anything? I mean, I would echo their sentiments. Um, one of the things that um, we challenge even at a very local level, I mean, I think I just encourage um, and, and see the more folks can engage within their local communities. And we had a national election, there was a huge turnout, and we're having a, a big change within the administration. But um, when you talk about, um, you know, how to kind of e expand with the community or what the future could look like, the more individuals are infiltrating and, and being a part of their local systems, I think that can expand and grow out. And then that goes to the county and the state. It has like these rever reverberations where that voice just gets stronger and that power gets louder. Um, and so I, I see this in implementing itself and in, in challenging jurisdictions to have uh, committees or task force that are community engagement task force where they get to define the parameters of what they want the budgets. I mean, the budgets are a moral document. They say, they, they put our spending and align it to where we say our priorities are and what we believe in. And I echo the sentiment whenever I look at our policing budget locally, the fact that we give a hundred and uh, $10,000 yearly to housing in our community locally, but we give $17 million to policing. And I think there's an issue there. And so I think being able to um, get individuals, communities, these like task force or committees that go alongside these, um, the police departments and alongside these budget processes, I think that that could have huge impact on these things that, um, that were being speak, spoken to um, earlier to actually create that change and to shift those resources over. Thank you. So we're just about out of time. For those of you that submitted questions, we will try to get you answers to all those questions via email. I'd like to give a huge thank you to our panelists. You guys have brought a diverse set of perspectives on how to transform the justice system through community involvement. I could have listened to you all speak for hours. I also wanna thank you all for um, attending. It's candid discussions like these that move the ball forward. So we appreciate your interest and look forward to continuing these conversations. So thank you everyone.